Where's the flag? Oh, is that? Oh. It's to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> They're testing us, yeah. <laughs> fire evacuation procedures. If there's a fire or emergency in the building, you can exit the door to the back of the room or to the door on the left and then down the stairs and away from the building. Uh, roll call, please. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Here. Kevin Zorda. Here. Virginia Higley. Here. Robert Hendrickson. Here. Ann Collins. Here. Nancy Martin. Here. Phil Cover. Here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Public communications. Is there anybody in the audience who wants to speak on items not on the agenda? Anybody want to speak on items not on the agenda? Nope. Seeing none. One last time. Anybody want to speak on items not on the agenda? Seeing none. Um, Georgie, do we have guests on the Zoom? Or no, just the Lodestar Energy for the solar okay. facility. You have, to, you have to admit somebody in, but um, aging correspondence. Does anybody have anything to my right? Nothing. Nothing. Anybody to my left? Nope. No. Okay. We did get some paperwork. It is now joining. Okay. It's <laughs> nice. Uh, Georgie handed us our new uh, agency bylaws. Mm -hmm. Some of us received our book for our Saturday, March 11th meeting, education meeting. Um, and I know we did get a couple emails regarding education from the town, so thank you for that. Approval of minutes for February 7th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of February 7th, 2023. Second. Okay, do we have any discussion? I think the only comment I noticed was in Paragraph five, last sentence, it says talk instead of talks. The yes S got cut off. Uh, what page? <laughs> uh, first page. Oh, first paragraph page. five. Oh, paragraph five. Yeah, yes. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. Anything else? So, do you have to amend the vote? Uh, so, so amended. Okay, Jenny. Second. Okay, can I have roll call? Donna Corbin Sabinski. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Ann Collins. Abstain. Nancy Martin. Yes. Phil Cober. Yes. Six in favor, one abstain. Motion passes. We do not have a town attorney report today. We do not have any continued public hearings or new public hearings or old business. <coughs> Excuse me. That brings us to new business. So we have DPN 2023-0126, 600 Enfield Street, application for a determination of need for regulated activities within 100 feet of Great Brook. Shiraz Chaudre, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Applicant, Troiano Realty Corporation, owner map 32, lot 8, BL zone. Are the applicants here? Hi, could you state your name and address for the record? Sure. Is that microphone on? Yeah, it's on, right? Yeah. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dave Zyax. I'm a professional engineer with F.A. Hesketh Associates. We're located down in East Granby, and I'm here representing the applicant. Um, what I brought along with me this evening is um, one of my crude colored sketches. Thank you. Thank you. Nope, I have extra. It's pocket size. Yeah. <laughs> this is the um, the old car wash gas station site that you're probably familiar with up about probably about a half a mile up Enfield Street here on the uh, left hand side on the west side of the road. It's uh, 1.31 acres and it's in the BL zone. Um, just to the north of the site is Grape Brook, which is down in a channel. Uh, there's a substantial slope from the brook up to the uh, northerly side of the site, which is that yellow line. The outline is the, uh, the property line. Uh, what we're proposing to do is to completely redevelop the site um, in that um, the car wash tunnel will stay 
and the little office building that's up near the um, <clears throat> near the uh, top of the slope that's going to stay. But uh, if you're familiar with this at all, there's on the south side of the car wash, there's a self-service open bay area. That's going to be demolished, and a small convenience store will be located at that location. And then the uh, gas canopy is actually going to stay physically, but it's going to be renovated, and then all brand new gas pumps will be put underneath it. Uh, tanks, new tanks will be put out near Enfield Street. And then, of course, all the associated plumbing and things of that nature to operate uh, you know, the new modern gas station. The uh, car wash will be renovated and uh, will remain in operation. Uh, as a result of this, we're going to have, um, well, as the reason we're here before you this evening is because uh, about 60% of the site or so, which is that red dashed line cutting through the site on my color, it is, is within the Upland Review area, which I think is actually pretty conservative. I just, I took the top of slope as, as the limit of wetland escarpment soils and, uh, and then added 100 feet to that. So that that's, brings us uh, uh, conservatively into the site. Um, we will have less impervious coverage. All the asphalt that's out there now will be uh, milled up and removed, and then uh, new asphalt will be put in. So we gain about 8% uh, green space on the site. And then we will be doing uh, nice, um, you know, architectural landscaping, aesthetic landscaping along Enfield Street and around the building and such, and just cleaning up the site in general. So we have a 2,770 square foot convenience store going in, which is about the size of the uh, open bay uh, self-wash area. And then we're having uh, five new pump stations under the canopy and then parking scattered around uh, basically painted parking spaces for 21 spaces, which includes uh, under the canopy for the convenience store and some employees. Uh, upgrades, we'll have a, a, a pretty much an entirely new drainage system. Uh, I'm going to be installing new stone edging along uh, the north uh, edge of the parking. That now sheets off. It's all sheet runoff there. We'll put a nice stone edge along that to uh, polish up any runoff from that area. Um, the area under the canopy and everything will go through our new storm drainage system, which discharges over uh, an existing location over on the west end of the site there. But we'll put in all new catch basins with uh, trapped hoods. Um, the, the new concrete pad under the canopy will be putting in the PLB grooving around that, which is the, you know, the, the, the spillage edging that goes around the canopy now. Uh, collects any minor spills that might occur under the canopy for cleanup. We're going to be reducing the driveway cut sizing out onto Enfield Street right now. There's pretty large driveway cuts out there. We're going to be shrinking those down in size and then constructing a new concrete sidewalk along the entire front frontage that does all the appropriate ADA ramping and such. And um, our plan has a complete erosion control plan incorporated. So we're sort of minimizing or reducing the footprint. There is some asphalt coming out, uh, primarily up in the northeast corner. Uh, there used to be actually a, a small used car parking lot there at one time. Uh, that's coming out. And then there was some encroachment over onto the abutting properties with asphalt. We're taking that out. At one time, the, uh, the landowners, the Trianos, they owned both the car wash and the shopping center next door. The shopping center was sold somewhere in the last few years. They still own the car wash property. So we're removing uh, encroachments off, you know, onto the old shopping center property. And we'll be replacing that with uh, loam and seating. So all in all, we're shrinking the footprint a bit, we're modernizing the whole site, and we're putting in the appropriate uh, storm drainage system that does not exist out there right now. And, um, and we've been working with staff now for the last couple months on the layout and the permitting process, and uh, the recommendation was to try a, a DPN uh, application and see if the commission agrees. And then if you do, then we'll move on to planning and zoning. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> my only concern is the, well, my main concern is the escarpment. Mm -hmm. Are you going to do any grading in that area, or are you going <clears> to <throat> grade away from it? Yeah, we're pulling back a ways a bit from that. I don't want to go over there at all past the, right now there's a um, sort of a, uh, I'll call it dilapidated uh, metal guardrail along the top. We're going to take that, pull that out pull ourselves back a couple of feet, 
put a nice stone edge across there and then put a new guardrail in. Okay, so the office isn't anywhere near the escarpment, right? No, it actually is pretty comfortably away from it, yeah. Okay. They're going to keep that building. They're going to continue to use it for okay. office purposes. Well, thank you. And there's nothing behind the office, right? No. No. Hmm. It used to be the office for the used car lot. So just some general comments, obviously being on Enfield Street, like you said, it's close by, so I know I've driven by it a few times, probably haven't really looked over at it. <laughs> um, but, you know, the main concerns for, you know, the jurisdictional hearing with the escarpment soils, um, and then obviously we're talking upland review area from an actual water course, not a wetlands. I mean, I think this would be a project I'd be in favor of a uh, permit being needed. Yeah. Yeah, especially since I know there was previously uh, contaminated soils that... There's, there's a good plan to continue um, monitoring that, um, I see. But I think given that, I would I'd be in favor of an application just to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also didn't see anything up that was standing out. Of course, concern for the escarpment, but you all have that question. Yeah. So, anybody this way? Any comments, questions? No questions, concerns? No? <laughs> Excuse me, Ms. Chair. Yes. I just want to point out a few things about this project. Um, we have met several times in the past with the applicant, and we have had a lot of meetings on the best point of development to go forward with this site since it is very sensitive and a sensitive location and it's almost 100% impervious. The applicant is actually proposing to reduce a lot of that impervious surface and bring a lot of it back into um, <clears throat> code that would meet our regulations better. Um, so I do just want to point out that there will be minimal disturbance on site for those areas, but of course the ultimate decision comes down to you as the agency for a DPN. Um, I would also like to just reiterate some of the remediation status and what's going on right now at the site currently and what's happened in the past. Um, I've been working with the Deep Emergency Department for Spill Response Management, and I'm just going to reiterate what they've been doing since the 1980s. Um, so back in the 1980s, there was previous soil contamination from the existing gas station. Um, the owners had consistently worked with Deep's Emergency Response and Spill Prevention Division to remediate these soils and conduct soil and water sampling. Um, the site redevelopment plan has been reviewed by Mr. Paul Tanner, a hydrogeologist with over 30 years of experience in environmental consulting. In his comments about their redevelopment proposal, he mentions that additional soil testing will also be conducted from the canopy during construction and excavation of the new dispensers and piping runs, which will be in the same places as the old infrastructure to better satisfy the USD guidance. Groundwater monitoring wells will be installed to monitor the older and new USD systems. This work is expected to be completed near the end of construction in the mid late to 2023. A summary report will be submitted to the DEEP that will document findings during the redevelopment process. The on site water supply will be researched, and if a bedrock well is used, the well will be tested and results will be included with the report. Mr. Tanner is also aware of the development plans for the passive soil venting systems in proximity of impacted soil and pea stone fill areas that are adjacent, adjacent to the existing car wash building and the proposed convenience store at the present present location of the self-service car wash bays. The comments concluded with a positive note about the redevelopment, and they look forward to reporting findings of the testing to the department. So I just wanted to point that out there, that they are actively monitoring it and actively working on it. And that's all I have. Thank you. And I think there's going to be some nice improvements. One, one more question I thought of. Where's the snow going? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's on the bigger plan, but... Yeah. Um, look here real quick. You know, the, the, the good thing about it, even with the reduction in the uh, asphalt on the site, there's still, you know, sufficient area. So I, I would imagine we would push it to the uh, west side of the site, away from the brook side. Oh, good. And get it to drain into our catch basin system, you know, uh, as it melts and go through the trapped hoods. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to point out, though, that the only area that drains towards Great Brook directly is, you know, the west or the north side, I'm sorry, of the car wash. Hmm. Everything inside the, you know, the high activity area around the gas pumps, things of that nature, that goes through our new drainage system first. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Could this be an agent? Yeah. So, so we could. <clears throat> I'm thinking that um, we could require a permit, but it could be an um, agent approval. Because of the contamination and different things on the site. Just to make sure. In the brook. Um. Anybody? Okay, it would pretty much be the same thing as like almost like a permit, just without the permit part of the application. Yeah. Yeah, say, yeah. yeah. Oh, make your. Turn your speaker on. Turn, Turn your speaker on. Your mic. Your mic. Put your mic on. Well, I'm going to second what Phil said. I, I think we need an application here for this. That's what I'm proposing. You propose, yep. I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it, it might be better than agent approval just because there's certain things I can and cannot do. Okay. Okay. So. All right. Okay. All right. Then I will make a motion um, to require a wetlands permit for DPN 2023 01 26. Second. Any more discussion? To my left or right? Yeah. So, Madam Chairman, basically what we would do is revise our current application, update the fee, and then be back for the next meeting, right? Basically, you have to resubmit all over again. It triggers a new statutory time frame, a new application. Yeah. You have to resubmit I mean, it's, copies it's, all over again. Yeah. 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 Yep. So you're basically restarting from scratch, but as a permit. But you got everything done. <laughs> and you, you'll get a new staff report, paperwork. of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Roll call. Donna Corbin Savinsky. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Ann Collins. Abstain. Nancy Martin. Yes. Phil Kober. Yes. So six in favor, one abstain. Motion passes. Thank you. One, one last thing, too, I'd sure. like to point out, just so you'll see, in case you see the paper, I think I'll probably just go ahead and file the the TPZ application request too, because that needs a public hearing down the road and all that kind of stuff, just so we don't lose too much time. I'm sorry, the what application? The TPZ the zoning application. Oh, we'll, PZC. Yeah. PZC. Yeah. You can. Okay. You Some can. towns are Somebody TPZ. Can. You guys are PZ. I should know that after 35 years. Um, but uh, I'll go. I just want to let you know, so in case you see the paperwork floating around, I'm just going to go ahead and file that because it's got to be received and then set for a hearing date and everything anyhow. So you uh, can submit simultaneously. Just yeah. keep in mind any revisions that the wetlands agency requests will have to be revised for PZC as well. Sure. Okay. And then PZC won't make a decision until and then wetlands has made a decision. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. I would say just make sure you put on there um, where the snow is going. Make it. Yeah. Put it yeah. I'll add that now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't hear any other really specific other questions, but yeah. And then if you um, think of anything, pass them through staff. We yeah, communicate all. Just have to submit a um, stormwater report in just more details. Oh, that's okay. All. That's right. Stormwater. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Next is DPN two zero two three. To 02792 Post Office Road, application for a determination of permit needed for minor disturbances in the Upland Review Area, Winbrook Combs LLC, applicant owner, map 47, lot 10, R44. Hi, could you state your name and address for the records? <coughs> Hi, Reinhard von Hollander, Winbrook Homes LLC, 14 Brainerd Road, West Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, uh, Roy McGee, uh, professional engineer with um, MNR. Uh, land surveying and engineering. Um, we provided the plot plan for uh, Mr. Reinhardt. Sure. I think everyone has the, um, the plot plan and also um, a write up that I did. Just speak into the microphone, okay? Because oh, um, sure. this is broadcasted live on YouTube and there are side microphones if you oh, need I'm them. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, Rin Rinbrook Homes LLC um, is proposing to construct a single family house um, with a two car a garage um, within the setback zone at um, 92 Post Office um, Road here in Enfield. 
Um, this house is, a proposed house is um, within all the, uh, the required uh, setback zone as um, the town uh, has. Um, presently, um, about three quarter of the, the property slopes to the rear of the, the, the property. Um, there is a wetland designated um, about 100 feet from the, um, the back of the proposed house. Um, the proposed contours and also the existing contours um, will maintain the same, about the same drainage. Um, the, the proposed contours will allow the stormwater to drain to the rear of the, the property. Um, but because of the distance of the wetland area away from the house, there shouldn't be um, any impact to that wetland area. Uh, most of the stormwater from the, the roof, uh, roadway, uh, driveway, sorry, will definitely infiltrate or percolate into the um, existing ground. Um, there's really not much more to, to explain about this, this development. Uh, unless there's any questions. Um. Madam Chair, if I may read my report for you. Yes, please. Yes. So this is an application for determination of permit need to allow for the development of a single family home within the driveway. The proposal is for a vacant lot, 92 Post Office Road, with wetlands located in the rear of the site. There will be very minor disturbance through the 100 foot upland review area, which includes a small corner of the eastern side of the house, as well as very minor grading. The foundation will be about seven feet deep. Um, there will not be an increase in stormwater runoff and excess water will be directed away from wetlands and will drain through percolation into the ground according to the applicant's PE. Drainage, the proposal does not show an increase in stormwater runoff or runoff that would adversely affect the site characteristics or impact the wetlands adversely in the back of the property. The site's topography would not result in water runoff onto the adjacent neighboring property and the drainage will remain the same as before construction for the most part and the neighboring property's upgrade. Up upgrade compared to the site. Um, there are also erosion controls proposed for this application. Sediment and erosion controls are proposed around the site and they are, are also included around the temporary soil stockpiling area. This excess soil will not be removed from site. It will be redistributed and it will assist with grading and backfilling for the foundation. There will also be an anti-tracking pad to reduce sediment from going into the roadway. The wetlands were re-delineated in April of 2022 by Eric Davison of Davison Environmental, a professional soil scientist. This shows an increase of wetlands on the site compared to the original delineation in the early 2000s. Um, the survey notes that a few of the field flags were missing. That's just because the survey was done way after the wetlands delineation was done and over time flags tend to disappear. Um, but the line is pretty straightforward. There's very minimal disturbance in the upland area, which is why they are here for a DPN. Um, and that, that's it, that's all I have. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions, comments? excessively drained and the actual soil survey is listing them as Skidiko Shaker and Maybrid hybrids, which are the my, my letter? Yes, this. I didn't so, write that. that. The engineer I wrote, wrote that, that letter. The, um, the soil classification is in the wetland area, the one that um, from the soil scientists. They classify just the soil in the wetland area. So you're just referring to the Part the developed, the, the developed area. So you're not disagreeing with the, the wetland areas delineation. No, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with that. No, and that's why we, uh, Mr. Hollander, hired the soil scientists to designate the wetland areas and classify the you, soil. You don't offhand know what your soil type is in the in the area that's excessively drained. No. Is it I, Windsor? 
I, I don't know. I would have to go back and, and check. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I just thought the reports conflicted in the actual naming of the soils. I, I think what um, his his this letter says is that they're referring to the uh, University of Connecticut soil fe feasibility map. Right. Um, is what lists it as excessively drained. The right. soil science report. The soil yeah. science report includes the soil classifications right. and the types. They are comprised of Skidiko Shaker and Mabig complex, and the Skidiko series consists of very deep to poorly drained soils formed in silty and clay sediments. They are in nearly level and very gently sloping soils and low lying positions. Um, And the non-wetland soil is characterized Those are, as Bancroft. Yep, Bancroft series, which are very deep, somewhat poorly drained to moderately well-drained and somewhat poorly drained soils formed in silty and clayey glacial lustrine deposits. I have a question. On the um, February 20th letter to Georgina, um, it's, it states that... Uh, Second paragraph, the uh, University of Connecticut soil feasibility map for the state of Connecticut shows 92 post office rows as excessively drained. What year was that feasibility map done? I don't remember. I would have to go back and check their um, site. Well, I know that on that property there were wetlands created at one time when and that resulted in a lawsuit. So I'm just questioning if this was done before the lawsuit or after the lawsuit. I, I, I would have to go check that out. But um, again, the soil scientists designated where the wetlands are. Didn't is, they go on the flags that were there already? No. No, they actually went oh, out there. Oh, yes, they, they actually went out and did okay. it. Yep. So my, yes, my staff yes. report notes an increase in wetlands, actually. That was a part of the court case. Okay. The other part of the court case was every lot involved would have to come for wetlands for approvals. Yep. The neighboring lots came in for DPNs as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is one of the lots that had to come for approval. And is requiring a permit, according to the yeah. lawsuit. So. Yep. Um, we discussed this back in July. Yeah. So when you cut the trees, <laughs> staff. <Just for laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, staff had met with Mr. Hollander before just to go over some of his proposal, and we came up with the DPN just because of the minor disturbance in the upland. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> I personally would like to see a in the wetlands application based on the past history of the property yeah. and the past decisions that were made on the previous the members that were on at the time none of us were on that i, I agree for the same the reasons time. that yeah. donna says yeah and i know there's plenty of documentation that can be found i do just want to point out that even though this property was involved in a court case a few decades ago it does not come into, into play today besides what was yeah. the outcome of the settlement so the only outcome was they needed wetlands approval and redelineation but whether or not they need a permit is completely up to you which you can yeah. require the applicant to apply for one but just want to let you know that that doesn't really impact the future development of any site that has gone through a court I case. I only asked because the feasibility study, that map didn't have a year on it, and I wanted to know if it was before the additional wetlands or after, after. the additional yep. wetlands. So the feasibility study was an extra um, material by the applicant. Normally our applications don't even have anything like that, so no, I would go by the soil us. report. Right. Yep. Yeah, they gave it to us, so I was curious. Mm -hmm. And, and we have to make sure they're not going after the old maps and everything else because it's those old maps are not valid anymore based on what happened in history. Yes. <laughs> Thank what, you. What do you mean well, the old old maps? Our current GIS map. And no, they're going by a whole new delineation. They have they have all new okay, redelineations. Nothing is from the old maps. Okay, that's good. Okay. So, do we have a copy of the soil science report from April? Yes, it should have been in your packets from the February 7th meeting. This way? Hmm. Yep, from Davison Environmental. Yeah, you got it. Hmm. And I also know this is in a next to a flood area. 
to the right of the property. Yeah, it's listed on there. So yeah. It's on the map. Yeah, but it's the 500-year flood zone. It's non-regulated by our town. Yeah. I just want to throw one more monkey wrench into this. Those <laughs> those um, aforementioned soils are less than 2 or 3% typically found in Hartford County. So it's somewhat questionable that, that that's not our typical soil. It's normally Windsor. I was I was hoping to talk to the soil scientist and ask if that was a, a finger of the lower county or a different type of terrace because these are listed as marine terraces as well as glacial lacustrine. That's and, more of a question and for the, the applicant. The, the two pictures that are presented do not look like typical wetlands. They they do look like the scrub, shrub, drier, better drained things. So. Again, I'm, I'm not the soil scientist, so you'd have to ask the soil scientist. Right. So it would have been nice if he had characterized the entire. I, I did suggest that if he could come tonight, he should, but unfortunately, it was a little bit last minute for him to attend. Okay. Do you understand where the 100 foot? Buffer. It's a little confusing. It is confusing. Yeah. It's a it's a little confusing because the uh, 100 100 foot uh, wetland buffer on the site plan kind of stops abruptly. <laughs> no, you should have a revised site plan. But it shows the, the Upland View area all the way through. Is that the one you got today? Oh, okay. The one I gave you earlier today. They look, they look similar. It should have today's stamp on it. Oh, 220. 220 you want. This oh, yeah. Okay. Not 2-3. Yeah, All right. Ah, okay. That makes more sense. <laughs> that was one of my first um, comments. Okay. It does say on here too that the wetland flags weren't found. Yep. Yes, when they did this. I mentioned that because they were done in April 22 and the survey was done in October. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're showing more wetlands. So. Yeah. So the mound in the back side of the house is staying? No, that will be um, removed and redistributed um, in the proposed grading here. Okay. That's actually um, a, a dirt pile that was put there. Before. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah. have my same feeling yeah <laughs> yeah all right um, I will make a motion to require a wetlands permit for DPN 2023-02-07 second any discussion to my left 
more discussion here. So just based on the disturbance and the updated mapping, I'd be in favor of requiring the permit. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, roll call, please. Donna Corbett Savinsky. Yes. Kevin Zorda. Yes. Virginia Higley. Yes. Robert Hendrickson. Yes. Ann Collins. Yes. Nancy Martin. Yes. Phil Cover. Yes. Seven in favor. Motion passes. So you'll have to file a permit like the yep. previous person. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is Raffia Farm Solar Facility Proposal. So they are here <laughs> with us virtually. Yeah, um, welcome. Just a reminder, participants, you are muted, so just unmute yourself before you speak into the microphone. And then just when you, when you speak, do state your names and addresses for the record. Hi. Welcome. Can they hear us? Hello. Hello. <laughs> So, George, you want to give a little overview? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, this is. Good evening. My name is Gary Ortolano. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead. You go, go ahead. ahead. Mm -hmm. so, so, my name is Gary Ortolano, and I am the attorney representing the petitioner, LSE Hercules LLC. Um, we have submitted a, a petition for declaratory ruling for, to the Connecticut Second Council for the project on Rafia Road. Um, I'd like to introduce our team that's here with us tonight. Um, Jeff Maisel is in the in the audience live with you. He is one of the owners of the um, petitioner LSE Hercules. Um, so Jeff's there in person if you have any questions for him. We also have Jamie Smith on, who is another owner of the project. And then with me is Sam Vallone on our development team. And then we have Matt Gustafson and Kevin McCaffrey, who are both with All Points Technology. Kevin is on our engineering team and Matt is on our environmental team. And I'll turn it over to Sam for a brief overview of the project. Everyone, I'm Sam. Um, I'm a bit sick, so apologize for the voice. Um, but our project is located at 99 through 113 Rafia Road. Um, the site and surrounding sites are all under common ownership of Rafia Farms. And the project is a four megawatt AC ground mounted solar facility. The total project area will cover about 14 acres. Um, for some background, the project was bid and awarded into the statewide program called SCEF, which stands for Shared Clean Energy Facility Program. Um, turning to our site plans, which I think you guys have in front of you, um, is it helpful if I share my screen, maybe? Sure. Okay. Okay, hopefully that works. So <laughs> these are the site plans, as you can see, the main solar array. Um, for vehicle access, we're proposing um, going through an existing access roadway, which is across from Post Road and goes kind of behind um, this parking lot here into the southern portion of the array. And then for electric access, we're proposing putting um, three utility poles um, right along that access roadway, also coming off Rafia Road to the southern portion of the site. Um, for reference, um, in terms of the current use of the property, most of the central portion of the site is cleared away and it's used for timber processing, chipping, and storage. Um, to the north, there's an open farm field. And then to the southwest, there's a few farm buildings. And then to the southeast, there's a small wooded area. Um, overall, we think this is a fairly easy and straightforward solar site. We think it's a great opportunity to develop on an, an active industrial site. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Carrie, maybe to talk more about 
um, the permitting process that we're going through. Sure, and as I think everyone on the um, commission is aware, this project is under the exclusive jurisdiction of the Connecticut Siting Council. Um, that application was filed on January 5th of this year with the Connecticut Siting Council, and they recently just submitted their paperwork showing a deadline for decision of July 5th. Um, so during that time, the Siting Council will be re reviewing the application, um, and all the materials that have been submitted and the decision will be rendered by that date in July. In addition, and, and simultaneously with the filing of the application to the Connecticut Siding Council, we also filed our application materials with Connecticut D, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection Stormwater Division. Um, the Stormwater Division has a separate appendix, Appendix I, that is specific to commercial solar developments. Um, and we have to show that we are in compliance with those requirements. That application is also pending, um, but as I, I know was, has been noted in some previous correspondence from your staff, um, we did, the, the petitioner and our professionals that are here tonight um, ha had a meeting with the deep stormwater staff prior to filing um, to receive their input. And that input was incorporated into the design that you see in front of you, and that's pending with the Siting Council. Um, so with that, we also, we had received a memo um, from your staff with some questions and comments. We did prepare a written response, just so you had those items in front of you. We're happy to discuss any of those items in more detail or any questions you may have for our team. I know we did, we had concerns about the escarpments. Mm -hmm. There was confusion. Did we get that squared away, jo uh, Georgie, or as where they were, if they were? I believe we should let Lodestar explain what they're doing within the escarpment layers and where their limit of project disturbance is and what their details are about their tree topping proposals and okay. all the environmentally sensitive stuff. Thank you. Can somebody speak to the escarpments? Sure, I'll hand that over to Kevin. Um, do you want to discuss the location of that, Kevin, on the plans? Is Kevin on? Is Kevin, he's on, I think, but he's, I don't know if he's having audio issues. Um, I cannot do that. How's that? How's that? That's better. That's better. Yep, now it's <laughs> Sorry, sorry. sorry. It's, uh, it's double muted. Yeah, that's okay. So, so if you, you want to put that plan, plan back up. Yeah. yeah. Put it back up. Um, exhibit seven. Hmm? Yeah. Exhibit seven. Uh. So, so the, the intent was, was to site the, the, the facility up in the quote unquote level portion of the property. Mm -hmm. So our goal is to stay away from these escarpments. So they are they're all out on the perimeter, the south and the east sides. So the terrain really drops off in those areas as it goes down to the wetlands. So those I'm sorry to interrupt real quickly, but can you actually show us the grading plan instead? Because it would give us a better idea of where you are grading in relation to those escarpment locations. Yeah. Because mostly the grading is what we had concerns about, as well as which parts of these escarpments you will be disturbing. So that's a good one right there. So you see the escarpments where that cocoa is really heavy down on the south and so as I stated, we're, 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 planning, we're planning to stay right out of those areas. So we'll come down to the limits of where they're working now, tie into existing grade, and then maintain that vegetation that is set up south of the property now. Oh, the limit of those escarpments? Hmm. I don't, I don't think, think anybody, anybody has tried to delineate them with a, with a line on the plane. But you can see where the topo gets really concentrated and drops off. But, so you're proposing the grade 
all those areas that are potentially escarpments? No, no, we're going to stay out of those areas. So just to clarify, on that page that we're looking at now, the solar panels are, be are seen over top those grading lines. So are those grade lines proposed? Are those existing? That's, That's the proposed, proposed grading. grading. OK. Smooth out the train on site. So now for the, for the grading you guys have, do you guys have like a fill plan? Is there a fill coming in or is it going to be cut from what's existing on the property? So, so. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that part. Yeah, yeah I, just, I, I said I need to pull the numbers up. Uh, we, we are showing, showing a, a net, net cut. cut. OK. Okay, thank you. Just just out of curiosity, have you thought about reconfiguring the site a little bit different differently to better accommodate for less cut and fill by chance? Um, how do you mean better? Like, I'm, I'm just curious, like um, maybe reduce the amount of solar panels in that area. I'm just curious what your team has thought of for this project. Right now, the grading we have on there was to get Okay. Yeah, what's what's confusing, I think, is and you know, it's it's tough looking at this size map <laughs> and determining this, but. From from our perspective, it looks like you're telling us you're not going into the escarpments, but the plan appears that it is. Yeah. So that's, I think, where the confusion is. Yep. Would it be possible to maybe zoom in on an area that is concerning you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's this finger to the... Um, the kind of the east, this is paid GD2. At least for me, yeah. Okay, right. so on the yeah. plan that's up right yeah. now, right, right down, down on the south, south end, end, there's a, a wetland sort of finger here, comes up to the north. Correct. And then you see we've got our limited, limited disturbance line, arcs around that. And when I look at that topo, I'd say that line is generally at the top of the steep slope. For clarification purposes, could you please tell us what page you're on? It's a little confusing GD2. to see. GD2. I was on GD2. That's not the same, is it? Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. I thought you switched it. My apologies. Of the tree topping strategy. Sure. I, I want to bring that up because that's relevant to this area right here. Uh, see that region between oh, we've got an LCG line and LRD. Yep. So limits of disturbance are up to the north, and then that, that corridor between those two lines, we're going to just top trees. Mm. So no stumping, no grubbing. The intent is to keep that ground cover intact. Um, I have a question, if I may, for Lodestar. Sure. Just out of curiosity, since you mentioned before that nobody has added the escarpment lines to the plan, have you um, looked at the town's wetlands layer and the GIS to find that escarpment line? Um, Kevin, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. 
No, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, okay. Matt, perhaps you can address the, the sources of information for the wetlands delineation. Hi, this is uh, Lodestar. I was the um, wetland scientist just the record that the delineation on site. Um, wetland boundary you're seeing uh, under your flag boundary. As far as the limits of the dark and slope, and yeah, kind of going back to what Kevin said, that, that, that isn't a lot that we delineated or identified either on the plant or, or on the ground. You use that kind of fairly clear top slope, and there's a wetland boundary at the bottom of the toe of the slope. Those start missing. I'm, I'm sorry, Matt, you keep breaking up. Yeah. We can't really make out what you're saying. Is this any better? Yes. Yes. So again, yeah, again I'm not going to jump for the uh, all points technology. technology. I'm, I'm the wetland, wetland scientist who did the wetland, wetland delineation, delineation on site. On site. So, so we do we have the flag delineated wetland, wetland boundary, which generally forms the toe of slope for these escarpment slopes that you have noted. Uh, as far as the limit of those escarpment slopes at the top of the slope, Ray have said it's not something we had identified. Uh, as, as a, a, a delineated boundary, boundary. Um, nor am I familiar with anything that the pound produces that would identify such a layer. But again, the bottom of those escarpment slopes uh, generally coincide with the uh, delineated wetland boundary. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. No. <laughs> Georgiana, what's the base of the town's wetland maps? Are they based on the the state's wetland maps, or were they actually delineated by a wetland scientist? Um, I believe they were based off the state maps. Okay. A general flyover, you sure. know, um, remote sensing way back when. Um, but as our applications come in, they get updated and redelineated. Um, but that kind of surprises me by what Mr. Gustafson said, just because every town has a GIS layer to some extent mm -hmm. showing some kind of wetlands on it. So I just can't really imagine why um, professionals such as yourselves wouldn't consider looking at the town's GIS for wetland escarpments. Um, I understand the environmental analysis part of it, but. Um, I guess what it comes down to is just making sure we're clear on what the actual disturbance is in that escarpment area, just because they, they are very sensitive and they do erode away very quickly. Um, so the wetlands agency just has some general concerns about just trying to make sense of the site plan. Yeah, to, to be clear, those maps that are based on state data are much less okay. accurate than a field determination. I so, am aware. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> They are. <laughs> and and the, even if we relied on those when we go to siting council, we have to delineate these in real time. So, yeah. so and, and, and if I'm allowed, if I'm allowed, I may, for clarity, we, we do review the wetland, you know, the wetlands both state and town where it's available data. Um, I guess my confusion is in the terminology of escarpment slopes. Um, that's not something I'm familiar that that's a, a, a either a, obviously not a regulated boundary. Um, nor is it something that I'm familiar is maintained at a state or local level as a GIS layer. I could be incorrect. Um, but again, as far as the wetland layer um, at a local level and state level, those are both reviewed prior to our field investigations. So do you analyze the actual soil types to determine any highly erodible soils on site? Yes. And you didn't see any escarpment layers on this site? We have, we have identified, identified that there, there are highly erodible soils, soils, yes, and those, those generally match with the NRCS, NRCS data. data. Hmm. But that, that soil data is not uh, delineated as part of our wetlands delineation. Okay, with that being said, you're not going into those areas then? Correct. Correct. All right. Yeah, they're saying they're not. As we were just talking here, I mean, pulled up your GIS mapping and looked at that layer. It, it, it generally follows the topo, as we had talked about. To know exactly where it falls, I think we could get that actual plot. Play over and stuff. Okay. Um. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking of other questions that we had. Um, so 
So I see in your um, your team submitted a um, additional narrative, which thank you very much for answering some of our comments from before. Um, can you just go over this really quickly, just addressing from the initial comments that Lowstar received from the beginning of January and addressing some of those questions, like the aquifer protection, the sediment trap, the species concern that we had, and the potable water supply? Carrie, you're on mute. Still, I think you're still on mute, Carrie. Sorry. Classic mistake, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> it always happens to someone. Um, sure. We have received feedback, um, both, both verbally and in writing from your staff. Um, so we had prepared this memo to address some of those issues. Um, the first I'll note is the aquifer protection area. Um, and your team had, had pointed out that there was an incorrect reference in the narrative to our petition, stating that there, we're not in an aquifer protection area. Um, we've noted that that's not accurate, um, but our environmental assessment does address the fact that there is an aquifer protection area on the plans. Um, and we've also referred to and two of our site plans, which has our resource protection plan included in it, which includes those aquifer protection measures that we will be implementing on the site. Um, in addition, staff have requested that we include a prohibition of refueling within the aquifer protection area. And this week we will be submitting a supplemental filing to the Siting Council updating our operations and maintenance plan. And that will include that note. It already um, prohibited refueling in the wetlands areas or any of those um, upland review areas surrounding those wetlands. And it will also include the note that that won't occur in the aquifer protection area as well as requested by staff. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be filed this week. Um, so that should address the aquifer protection questions um, that you had raised. And again, I'd refer you to GN2 of the site plans, which lists in detail our resource protection plan, which includes protections to the aquifer protection area, along with um, species-specific um, protection measures that will be implemented on site during construction. So where will the fueling take place exactly? I, I don't believe that there's any refueling anticipated to actually take place on the site, but the um, emergency services plan right now says that it will take, take place only in the construction laydown area and not and on an impervious pad within that laydown area with secondary containment design and contained fuels. Um, so it will, it will be in a very limited space if, in fact, it occurs and there will be secondary measures in place to ensure that that still occur. Is there any way to fully ensure that no fueling on site will occur due to the sensitive area for aquifer protection? What, what we've added is, is the note that there will be no refueling within the upland review area of the wetlands and in the aquifer protection area. But you're doing it on a separate pad? We're doing it in the construction laydown area. Which is over the aquifer protection area? Which is what? Which is over the aquifer protection area? I don't believe that's correct. Hmm. I'm not sure. So then moving on, there was a comment regarding um, some confusion over the size of the project. Um, so on page two of our memo, we just explained that there's a difference between referring to the size of the project, which is four megawatts, and then the, the unit of energy, the output of the, of the facility, which would be 6.85 um, megawatt hours per year. Um, those things are consistent with each other. They're measuring different um, components of the project. The, the next comment that we had received regarded, really there was questions as to why D had requested that we remove a sediment trap from the, from the proposed project. 
Um, as I noted in our intro, we did meet with deep stormwater staff um, and went through our initial plans um, and they had requested this. I, you know, I can't tell you why deep staff <laughs> request what they do or do what they do. My understanding is that they were of the opinion that the impact for clearing um, required to install this sediment trap would really outweigh um, any benefit of having it. So they requested that it be removed and we did that. So then the next comment we had received was regarding species of concern. And I think here again, I think there was just some confusion regarding um, the terminology and the uh, reporting requirements that we have setting council. And that requires a review of what's called the natural diversity database that DEEP maintains. Um, Matt can probably address any specifics related to that, but essentially when we have a project design, we submit the details to DEEP and they let us know if there's any species that they've identified in the natural diversity database that we need to pay special attention to. Um, we submitted that and we did not receive any feedback back from DEEP regarding that. Um, I know staff noted the presence of vernal pools and some vernal pool obligate species. Um, those do exist, they're included in our environmental assessment report, um, but they're not um, included in the natural D diversity database. Um, I'd also refer you to sheet GN2 again of our plans, which is our um, resource protection plan which goes through in detail um, the construction measures that will be taken to ensure um, protection of those vertical obligate species on site. And as part of our compliance, we also have to consult with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, which we've done, um, and any compliance measures that are required from U.S. Fish and Wildlife are also included in that resource protection plan and discussed in our environmental assessment report. And then finally, there was a couple of questions um, regarding our O&M plan. Um, and I'll give a brief overview, overview but Kevin, um, you may want to jump in here as well. Um, but I think there was just some overall general concern regarding what kind of monitoring is going to be occurring during pre-construction and construction and after the fact. Um, and I can tell you, you know, the process is rigorous for us. Um, it's not, it, it's maintained by, we're required to hire a third party monitor. We're required to report to DEEP. Um, DEEP has local conservation districts that we're required to engage and they come to the site bi-weekly during the construction period and also during any rain events, I believe over one quarter of an inch, but Kevin can confirm that with me. Um, in addition, the, as the petitioner, we're required to post a letter of credit or a bond with DEEP um, covering, I believe it's about $7,500 or $10,000 an acre for our limit of disturbance. And that's in place in the event that there's a stormwater control failure and for some reason that that failure occurs and for some reason, which will not happen, but in the event that it did, that we didn't fix it, that DEEP could step in and use those funds to correct any stormwater control issues. Um, and certainly, Kevin, if there's anything you want to add regarding construction monitoring and the implementation of the erosion control measures, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, that was a good summary. I'll, I'll just emphasize your point about the conservation districts. Relatively new. So. Yeah, Kevin, if you can speak up, you're, 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 you're not muted, but it's hard to hear. So I just wanted to emphasize your, your point about the conservation districts. Um, that's new with this, this, this newest version of the GPD Connecticut. And it's basically verification of the third party inspection. So Lodestar is required to have us on site, as she mentioned, uh, weekly basis and after rainfall. But then the conservation district is also inspecting on behalf of uh, D. So they're basically checking us as we check the contract. 
systems. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I have one additional question for the Lone Star team. Um, <clears throat> in regards, just going back really quickly to the aquifer protection area, because mm -hmm. we are very protective of the aquifer layers as they are the public drinking water supply. Um, has the team talked with the Hazardville Water Company to confirm the actual boundary of the APA layer, just for safety precautions in case, heaven forbid, something happens on site? Them. We, to my knowledge, if there's not been any conversations yet, as part of our resource protection plan, we do have a notation in there that they will be notified um, prior to construction start. Uh, there's a minimum timeline, so we do that well in advance to uh, ensure that if they have any concerns that they can be addressed prior to the start of construction. There's also an invitation extended to um, have their teams that are pretty so we have not uh, answered your question. We have not uh, engaged with the Hazardville um, Water District yet, but it's, uh, at some point uh, prior to construction, they will be engaged to ensure uh, their comfortability. Process and everything. Um, when you do engage with the Hazardville Water Company and they have comments, how are those comments applied to the construction project? Mm -hmm. Are you able to revise your construction project, or since it's already been approved by the siting council, you wouldn't consider those revisions? So I'll take this one. <clears throat> we pull a building permit from the town of Enfield, mm -hmm. so they'd be able to channel any comments through that building permit process with the local building inspector. How so? Um, they can coordinate our process during the building process. Your inspector will actually be overseeing the projects so if so, they're so they work concurrently with the Hazardville Water Company, because I have not seen that for se. Like I'm not, they don't get necessarily tagged in to the building application. So I'm just wondering if there's like a meeting you guys have or like how that's exactly coordinated. Yeah. So we typically work with the fire company before we come out here. We could include the water company as part of that, um, just to ensure that when we do pull the building permit, we're in compliance with all town bodies that will need to be on site. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be good. Does the agency have any further questions or concerns about the project? No, no. Jenny? Well, I think you uh, hit most of them. Yeah. I just had a question. This doesn't uh, pertain to wetlands, but I'm just curious. Where is the electricity going to be used? Oh. Is it staying in Enfield? Sure. So it will go to Eversource. <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, we sell the power back to Eversource under, as um, Sam mentioned here, the uh, shared uh, clean energy facility program. They prioritize local users for that, so people will be able to subscribe to it through Eversource's program. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, I do have one other. Uh, it's it's unrelated to wetlands per se, but um, there's a. Um, a solar facility in Broadbrook, um, and I'm a landscape designer, and I have a customer over there. And there are some units, they have fans in them, they have a really high-pitched um, noise it puts out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, it, it, and I've experienced it, it's, it, it makes you ill. Is, <laughs> is that something that's going to happen here, too? So it shouldn't, we, the decibel levels, it sounds like something's wrong with that system. Um, the decibel levels of the fans on what are the known as the inverters, they're, they're air cooling fans. Okay. So you would only hear that on hot summer days, typically when the fans are cooling. Um, but the decibel levels, when you get to 50 feet away, almost inaudible, 75 per feet away, inaudible. So yeah, these are, that. that's not the case here. This is, um, it's very similar land, uh, you know, old farmland, and it's hundreds of feet away. They even put up some plywood, mm. fencing, and some <laughs> arborvitaes, hundreds of arborvitaes that died, um, honestly. And it, yeah, it's, it's um, pretty, 
like oh. they are ready to move. It's so bad. So I was just uh, concerned about that. Sure. Yeah, and they run all the time. Well, I mean, it was summer, so yeah, um, and it was a hot summer we had. So I could see how they'd run, but it was. They said it was. Um, they talked to folks, and it was like three decibels under what was considered acceptable from their house to the the inverters. Yeah, and that's that's a very different yeah, yeah level. Um, we have a facility um, on Powder Hill, Powder Hollow Road here yep. that you can go and see the inverters there at the front end there, and and you'll see they're inaudible once you get about. Yeah, um, I live right up the road from there, and I don't hear anything yep. at all. So I was just wondering if. Yeah, and these are these are at least currently designed with the same inverters. So, Super, excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. The only other note that I would make is that one of the comments that we had received from town staff was that the zoning enforcement officer be added to our emergency contact list. And again, as I noted, we'll be filing a supplemental filing this week. Um, that will include that updated um, emergency contact list in our operations and maintenance plan. So you'll see that come across. Will there be an X amount of time the solar panels will be on the land? Will it be removed ever in the future? Just wondering that. So we have a 20 year uh, lease with Rafia Farms and then the plan is to, we have uh, I'm not sure, Carrie, you may know better than I do, two or three five-year options that we can exercise beyond that 20-year period. So the panels are warrantied for 25 years. We have every intention that it'll stay for that period of time. Okay. Um, so if Lodestar, does Lodestar ever remove panels or close projects? We have not to date. Um, so it's something that we intend to keep long term. And if we do, there's, uh, w it would be probably to upgrade panels or something, and that would be kind of a 15 or 20-year time horizon. Okay. Okay, um, I just I'm gonna speculate a little bit here. Do you anticipate ever removing panels from a solar facility site? Like, oh. I'm just I'm just wondering if you have an after site process in place if you do need to remove the panels or to like like would you restore some of the impact those panels have caused or just would it just be untouched after the panels are removed? Oh, oh, so like a decommissioning. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we typically have decommissioning requirements with the landowners in our leases. So we remove everything. Um, and Carrie, I don't know if you can speak to anything further. I don't know if there's any other obligation we have We're, beyond that. Uh, pursuant to our siting council approval, if the, if the system isn't in operation for a certain amount of time, we're required to remove it. Um, and as part of our siting council approval and what we need to submit prior to approval, um, we can only install equipment that complies with um, environmental standards as to how it will be recycled um, after it's removed. Um, so the siting council is ensuring that not only are we removing that facility, but that we're installing materials that are environmentally safe and will be removed as required by environmental regulations. So would they come back? No. So you so would what? come back to the t would you come back to the town and say we're removing everything or? Um, I don't I don't know the answer. I mean, to that. twenty five years is a long time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably not going to be here. <laughs> I don't think it's supposed to be here. Yet. Um, we we don't we typically well, on, I, I on the would probably get um, a demolition <laughs> permit potentially from the town. Oh, that would make sense. Um, but other than that, we, we would simply remove it at the end of our lease term um, in compliance with applicable laws at the time. Do you have an estimation of between that 20 year span, like exactly how much power the solar farm would contribute to the grid? If it's like more feasible to do this project in the long run than disturbing some of the slopes and a little bit of the trees, just trying to understand the balance. So with uh, the siting council process, we've done and we've looked at sites like this that are treed where we've had to cut trees down and we've done an environmental payback analysis and it's been 30 days or less for us to cut down 10 acres of trees to pay that back. As Carrie previously indicated and in that uh, in some of our materials, 6.5 million kilowatt hours is what this would generate per year. So just over 20 years, that would be. Let's see how good my math is here. 130 million, is that right? Yeah, um, 130 million kilowatt hours. And um, 
the average home uses, you know, 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. So it, it's, it, it's an awful lot of power. Yep. yep. If you look at a carbon debt analysis, which is included in our petition filing and exhibit eight, it'll do the math for you. But essentially, the carbon offload um, is going to make up for the tree loss in 4.6 days of operation. Um, and then it gives some it gives some good um, comparisons as to the amount of generation um, and what that how that equates to homes and cars and um, you can find lots of information to kind of compare how much um, what the carbon offload is for the project. Thank you. I have one last question, um, <laughs> just to put a concurring note on it. Um, what about stormwater runoff with the panels? Are you having like some of the trenches, a little, little bit of trenches dug in between each row, or how are you mitigating that exactly? Will there be an increase to the Scantic River? Is it going to contribute to that? Just curious how that's going to exactly play out. So I mentioned that 50 percent if you're under that percentage, state is not considered panels as a surface area. Well, that, that wasn't my question. I'm just wondering how you are dealing with the stormwater from those panels. Are they staying, are they percolating into the ground? Are they going towards the Scantic River? So that, that was uh, kind of where I was going with the site would be better to get Okay. So just kind of sinks okay. Well. Do you anticipate an increase in water runoff from the site to adjacent properties? No, no we're not allowed to do that. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. I really appreciate yeah. all the answers. And that stormwater bond stays in place for two years after construction is complete, okay. just to ensure that there's no water leaving the site. Perfect. That's, that's good. That's good, yeah. Yep. Any other All right. questions? Nope. Yeah. Well, I do appreciate just coming and talking with us and listening to our concerns. Well, thank you for having us and if, thank you. If you have any other questions, please, please, please feel free to reach out. Um, and Georgie, I will send you a copy of that filing that we're making this week so that you have that. That'd be great. Thank you. But if there's any other information or questions, please feel free to reach out. We're happy to get you any answers we can. Thank you. And thank you for meeting with us. Um, so last minute with deciding council and good luck moving forward with them. Yeah. Good luck. It was interesting. All the, everything we learned, learned some more today. <laughs> thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Let them. So next on our is agenda is now exiting. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. N next is, thank you very much. Enforcement reports? Um, none to be reported right now. Report of planning staff? Um, I did receive an email from Graham for Yankee Castings. They are working towards a time frame, and I suspect he'll be back in soon. Thank you. No new applications? No applications being received. Um, that we have? No. Yep, yeah. so that the DPNs will have to reapply. Right, right. Um, miscellaneous? Anything? Comments? Yep. Any, Brandy, anything? No? No, I, I want to say thank you, Georgie. Good questions and yeah. kind of succinct in, in some of the concerns we had, but thank you very it's, much. It's a, it's a big project. There's yeah, a lot is a big to project. take yeah. into consideration. Yeah. So it's hard to get all of your thoughts in a row, especially with a 30 or 40 page site plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's good and to- actually trying to determine where everything was yep, going. It helps when the team has a lot of professionals on their staff, that way they can help answer questions. Yeah, definitely. Motion dance. Move I to. will make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting's adjourned. It's 819. All right.